In this film series, we look into five Celtic port towns that are connected and intertwined by the ferry routes that serve them. To get to know the landscape and the history, we hear from the people in the know. We meet up with seven local characters. Historical archivist, Audrey. Local guide, Shane. Kayaker, Jenny. Folk musician, Sean. And ex-dock worker, Kay and friends. We hear of their passion for heritage and how their love of the place they call home is shaping the future. Welcome to Port's past and present, Dublin Port. We're on Strand Road, heading up the south cliffs of the Hope Peninsula on Dublin Bay. These are maybe the best conditions for human life in Ireland. And for 10,000 years, people have known that and they've been living up and down these cliffs. When the tide goes out, the intertidal zone explores all the food sources and all the nutrition and everything that you would need. And it has always been like that. By the end of the 18th century, the British had discovered that Dublin Port itself and Dublin Bay was too hostile to sailing ships because of the westerly winds. And William Bly was sent over after the mutiny on the Bounty to survey Dublin and determine where would be the best place for a mail boat station for instant communications between Dublin and London. And William Bly decided that Hoth was the best place to build the mail boat station. I think it was the change to steam that led them to abandon it. And that harbour was pretty much left to rot, but we still have it, and we still have this beautiful little harbour. I think it's important to preserve the history of the port because it's intrinsic to the identity of the whole country. Everything that was coming in and out of the country came through the port. So this is uh, the bottle boy and it used to be O'Connor's and it was the most famous uh, Northside pub for dock workers. Back in the day, workers would come in every day, it was casual work, so they'd come in in the morning at 8 o'clock to what's called the Reed, where the foreman would select out individual dockers for working that day. People who didn't get selected on the 8 o'clock Reed would have to come back again at 10 o'clock. So in between times, the only place they had to go to was the pub. Pubs in the docks area had uh, permission to open at seven o'clock in the morning, so they were called early houses. This pub was um, had a special back room that was reserved just for dockers, um, and it was also invitation only. So if you were a young guy starting here, you knew you were in if you got an invitation to come in here, particularly on a Friday night. That was the best night for the crack. Probably the best informed people about global geography were dockers because they were handling all of these loads that were coming in. So all these exotic timbers and fruit and they knew where they were coming from, where the ships were going to. So they would have had a great awareness of what the, the world was. So I worked with my dad quite a bit because he wanted to teach me the ways of slinging different types of cargo. And then when the machinery started on the docks, it became a necessity to learn how to drive the different types of fork trucks. As the times moved on, the general cargo began to fizzle out a little bit. It all became containerization. So to move with the times, the first thing was to learn to drive one of the small fork trucks. And then the machinery got a little bit bigger. I was lucky to get one of the permanent jobs driving one of the big, we call them empty container handlers. I worked with a, with a gang and out of the gang there was maybe six or eight of us who drove the big machinery and we became our own little family and each of us knew more about each other than our wives knew about us. I would go back and start from day one all over again and I wouldn't do anything else. I was born and reared on the docks of Dublin. Everything was nearly cobblestone on the docks at the time. That was a Dublin in the 1950s to me. We done bulk bags, timber, steel, you name it. And then the containers come in. Everything was containerized. What you see behind me here now, that's the world we live in. 
the box took over the docks, the box that changed the world. I've had some great crack down here, I've worked very hard down here. I delivered goods all over Ireland. Every corner, every village, we delivered stuff to. Dublin was the main artery into the port itself, into the Dublin itself. I had worked previously in lots of sewing factories around Dublin. My father was a docker and he used to say to me, you'd have to get a union job, Kay. And he said, go down to Liberty Hall, see Mr Duff and tell him I sent you. So he brought us on, up on the lift and I said, my father sent me down uh, to get a union job. And he said, I have no job here for women, he said. And he said, well, actually, I've only got one job here at the moment, he said. And it's for down in Dublin Port, Milling Company, but for, it's for a fella, a youth. And I said, well, I can do what you can do. And I think he got a bit fed up with us. He said, go down Monday morning and see a guy down there called Paddy Murphy. So we got down to the Dublin Port Milling Company and I couldn't believe when I got there. It was a big industrial, huge big place, silos, forklifts. When I got there, Paddy Murphy came out and he had a big red face. He said, I'm not looking for any women down here. And I said, well, we were being sent by Mr Duff from the uni. He said, you have a job. I bought you a job for youths here, no women. And I said, well, I can do what? I said, sweeping up, sure I could sweep up. He got fed up with me. I knew why he got fed up, right, he said. And by the way, he said, this was the best part, right, where we were leaving. You just can't wear, you won't be able to wear mini skirts here, he said. The stairs are all over the place. So, yeah, all right, I said. He said, call into the office and get your jacket for your uniform. And then we started the following Monday. I was about 22 and I got a job down the port. And so I began on the East Wall, on the East Wall Road, I began as a dock runner. And so I began to work in the dock community and I absolutely loved it. And I miss it. And I go back down even just to reminisce sometimes. The sea brings everything to your doorstep. Getting ready to go for a paddle out to Docky Island. Um, and Bullock Harbour is quite a quirky little place, really. It's still home to lobster and crab uh, fishermen. It's one of the most popular spots for sea kayaking, really, in Dublin. And um, you can meet all kinds of characters down here. <laughs> Once you paddle out of the harbour, the whole place just opens up. Dublin Bay is a UNESCO biosphere, so as soon as you exit the harbour, you're straight away greeted by the birds, the seals. In the centre, you have the port, which is, you know, of course, full of history. Then, very close by, you have, for example, Docky Island. There you have 60 grey seals, you have dolphins, you have porpoises. So to have that kind of diversity in such a small space, I think makes Dublin Port a really special place. Around Docky Island was uh, at one time the main port for Dublin. And so it has all that amazing history going on, but it also has a colony of seals who are very playful, very curious and more than willing to interact when they feel like it with us and there aren't very many places in the world where you can have that coexistence of capital city industry and a colony of seals so I think that just makes it a, a very unique and special place. I'm a musician and I play the Yillan pipes, which are the, the Irish bagpipes. I'm third generation Dublin. I'm very much a dub, very proud of my roots here in the city. What's interesting about the relationship between the port, which isn't, isn't direct with Irish traditional music because it was, a, it was very much a music that came from the country, from rural people. It, it grew in strength in the city in the early 20th century with, these, with this migration of people. But one thing that was always strong and remained strong in the city was piping. I have a relationship with this city. It's a thing that I'm linked to. So I, I kind of approach it that way, the way you would a friend. And I, I like to tell the places that I appreciate about it and the things I like about it. And I hope that it likes me back. <laughs> so you're standing in the port and you're looking out there or at your other beach and you've got the sea and the sky and this line. And you always ask the question, what's over there? I, I couldn't understand anybody growing up in a port city who wouldn't have that smell in the air, what's out there, you know? 
whatever part of history that you might be interested in, you can walk the tale here. That journey of 10,000 years has only got as far as the last step you took. And so what you do is you take responsibility step by step for the next step in that journey.